All right. Well, thanks for. I'm sure there's lots of people who were thinking, you know, came to work or school today thinking like, I'm really interested about social biology. <laughs> so I realized that that's the audience. Um, uh, sociobiology is different than, uh, I, I'm assuming that may, you might not be familiar with the, the field, so sociobiology is um, applied uh, evolutionary theory to animals and behavior. So sociology, don't mix it up with sociology, they're actually very different and they hate each other, actually those two fields kind of hate each other. So one is nature, one is nurture. So sociobiology would be nature, um, sociology would be like your environment caused you to do things, whatever. Um, so in the field of sociobiology, one of, the, one of the things that they start looking at is um, how does evolution, um, uh, the history of evolution kind of influence behavior in animals and you know, most sociobiologists would include you know, humans as um, an animal as, as I would do as well. So how does human evolution, in our, for our particular perspective, influence our behavior? Um, and one of the things you get with evolution uh, is it's uh, what red and tooth and claw. Have you ever heard that before? You know, it's it's violent. So for every beautiful cardinal you you see, um, you know, if you like look outside and you're like, oh, it's, that bird is so pure, you know pretty or something, um, it took like you know millions of years of predation and suffering and violence to get to that kind of beautifully evolved bird. So that's 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 difficult, right? So what do we do with that if that's kind of ingrained? in animal nature, and if we are animals. So we know from human evolution that, um, that humans have had kind of a, a, a sordid uh, history. So we've been violent with each other, we've stole from each other, we've raped each other, we've had copious amounts of sex, we've had you know, all sorts of things that at, at one point was actually necessary for our survival. So that's one of the things that we have to keep in mind that there, let's not pretend that evolution is some sort of like kind or beautiful process. Um, so these things are actually necessary for survival at some point in you know, animal history, and in, in humans are no different. And so that, then in the 1970s, you get um, this guy named Richard Dawkins. He's kind of more known now for his outspoken atheism. Um, uh, but he's, he's, he's kind of an un, unfriendly person to Christians, <laughs> for sure. But he wrote this book in the 1970s called The Selfish Gene. The Selfish Gene, and it was actually a really good, it is a really good book. Um, it was very pr provocative, and it, um, it moved the conversation within uh, evolutionary theory, sociobiology in general, uh, forward, and that was a really good thing. Um, basically trying to say that like, uh, that what, what matters is not, a lot of times people are like, well, it's survival of the fittest, I care about myself. Not really, according to Richard Dawkins. You, and I, I think he's completely correct. You don't care about yourself. You care about your legacy through your genes. You know, that's what matters. And so what we call that is gene fitness or reproductive fitness. So um, what, what animals will do is they will, they will do things to preserve the, um, their own kind of uh, longevity and their own, their own uh, children's uh, kind of care on some level. So whether they do that knowingly or unknowingly is, um, you know, is up for debate. A lot of times we do that unknowingly, or a lot of times, according to sociobiologists, that's so ingrained in our, in our, space, and it's so ingrained in our natural life that we have no choice but to obey those genes. And so he comes up with this theory, the selfish gene, and it was really good and really popular. And and actually, right up until um, 2010, it was popular. Uh, and then there's a guy named E.O. Wilson. So E.O. Wilson, he's a guy who, who um, he, he studied ants, <laughs> all right? And he comes up with the, the field of uh, sociobiology. So he's like the father of sociobiology, which again, if you just you know, kind of came in, it's, uh, sociobiology is applied evolutionary theory to animal behavior. So how does the history of our evolution influence our behavior, our desire for sex, food, violence, uh, joy, happiness, pleasure, you know, it could be good things too, altruism. So what he says is he says, uh, he, he, he comes up with this theory. So he's a big name in the theory. And in 2010, E.O. Wilson came up with this theory called multi-level selection theory. All right, so multi-level selection theory um, really changed the game. And so this is very quite recent, and it, it just came to a book uh, like a year or two ago as well. Um, so it was, a, it was an article in 2010 that's now um, into a book. And it changed the game, and a lot of people were, were upset with E.O. Wilson. But here's what he said. He said, um, 
yes, it's individual evolution. So you, you only, it's, it's singular selection. So you, you select for your own genes. You don't select for like a group genes. There's no gene group selection kind of thing. Um, so this is sometimes pejoratively called group selection theory, just to kind of like jab at this guy. Because groups don't get selected for. But E.O. Wilson, really clever, it's a really brilliant idea. He says groups don't get selected for, but groups are made up of people that are individuals that reside in a group. No individual resides outside of a group. And so what he says is this. So the common theory was this. Let's say that you have a group that is, uh, I'm just representing the circle as a group, and X's is bad. Okay, that's kind of what I'm doing here in this amazingly intricate PowerPoint diagram, all right? So uh, X would be bad behavior. Your selfishness, your, um, uh, your aggressiveness, violence, um, uh, sexual promiscuity, those kinds of things. But let's just look at it as selfishness for the purposes of our arguments here. <coughs> so that what Dawkins and others would like to say is that selfish, the selfish gene kind of overrides us. Um, uh, and that is always selected for because at push comes to shove, you're always self-interested. Well, uh, that's, that's fine. There's always going to be some good apples within the bad apples. So the good apples, it, let's say a selfless person in a group of selfish people, how are they going to do? They're not going to do very well, right? They're going to be give, give, give. Everybody's going to be take, take, take. Okay, that's, you know, fair enough. Then you have um, other groups that are revolving around the same time period. Um, and so the same time period would be certainly for human evolution would be, you know, like 100,000 years ago or something like that. Before that, um, you know, other animals that are evolving, um, you know, the, the great apes, um, even some other mammals like dolphins and things like that are showing these kind of characteristics. There are good groups. These good groups have, sometimes have bad apples in them. And how are the bad apples going to do? They're going to do really well because everybody's going to be give, 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 and they're going to be take, 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 right? So you would think that, they, that, that what would get selected for in evolution would be badness, selfishness. But E.O. Wilson actually says, no, that's wrong. That's not how it works. And here's why, and I think he's completely correct. Over time, do, good, do bad groups, groups that are selfish, do they work together well? No. So can they build communities well? No, because they're always self-interested, totally self-interested. And so you see, actually, over time, these groups diminish and eventually peter out and, and die. And what ends up getting selected for are these groups that are, that are cooperative, cooperation, uh, selfless, altruistic, et cetera. Um, and you get the bad apples with them because the bad apples are like freeloaders on a train. You know, like they, they're hanging on because they're doing good. And those genes are mixing with everybody else's genes. So do we have a tendency towards violence or selfishness, towards self-preservation? Sure, of course we do because we're mixed with some of these genes. But by and large, actually, we're cooperative, we're altruistic, we're helpful. And it really shook up this theory because what he's, what he's trying to say is through multi-level selection theory, it is about the individual, but it's the individual that that um, is always housed within a group um, genetically. That, so what you get then is a group of people, like human society, humankind, that has um, a propensity towards altruism and actually not selfishness with that. So that leaves us kind of, I figured I would just kind of leave some space for questions. I can't believe we only have two minutes left. But We started late, you're fine. All right, so what that leaves us with is we're a genetic mixed bag. So, we aren't totally selfish people and creatures. Um, most, most animals, you know, actually the higher primates, um, uh, <coughs> even, but even like bugs, I mean, even ants and bees and all sorts of things, they're not totally selfish. There is a kind of altruism that is selected for. And that's because it's actually just better. It's just genetically fit um, to, to be altruistic. Why? Because My group will take care of my children. So it's better for me to be in a group of altruistic people than a group of people who are selfish and only keep themselves. And those are the genes that I'm mixing with. That's who we're making babies with. That's who our society is selected for. So this gets to a question, I think this gets to theological questions, uh, big time theological questions. So if we're naturally, and that's kind of where my book is going, if we're naturally this mixed bag of both um, genetic selfishness and mixed bag um, with maybe a little bit more genetic selflessness, if you're genetically prone toward altruism, 
Uh, is it fair for when you do nice things or kind things or good things, is it fair for us to be like, hey, good job, or... Um, so this brings us to theological problems. How does one become holy in this context, theologically? Um, well, I guess you have to read the book to find that part out. There's no time to talk about that. So that's a setup. It's a setup for the crux of the book. So, um, all right. Any questions or thoughts? As we're running out of time. Yeah. Actually, are subverted. The the selfish folks are the ones who rise, who ultimately end up being the rulers and the and the people who are the movers and shakers. Huh. But ultimately, because they're all selfish, and can't work together. Suddenly, the altruistic, you know, uh, 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 oppressed yeah. folks end up. That's really thoughtful. I I you know, um, it's such a new theory within sociobiology and human evolution studies that um, I don't think anybody's gotten to that se secondary level, you know, yet. But because they would say that, like, all of those, like, all of this, you know, took place, you know, po possibly even before humans had, had come on the scene. Um, but, but even with, you know, and this would be early, early humans, if anything. But I think you could make easy parallels to that. Of course, countries that are, you know, societies that work together are going to, just like, you know, the more dysfunctional we are here at SAU, the, the sloppier SAU is. The more like we work together hand in glove um, with you know students and staff and faculty and administration, the just the, the healthier our school is, of course. So I think you know when we are a marriage is the same way, right? I mean you could take this to all sorts of levels. The more altruistic you are in a marriage, the happier your marriage is. The more selfish individuals are, just the crappier life is, right? For everybody. Crappy is a technical term within social biology. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah, Mark? Does, does Christianity in some ways appeal to our self-interest? So the idea of a selfish gene would not necessarily be a problem. Uh, you think of all the times Jesus said, you know, he who would uh, find his life would lose it. Uh, or he who wants to be first should be last. Or I've come to give life to life more abundantly. It's kind of like, to me, it's Jesus saying, look, if your best self-interest is in following the path that I have. Yeah, I think you, you, you make a di good distinction, I think, between self-interest and selfish. So I think that we can kind of dis distinguish between those two things. So like, because otherwise you could say like, well, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was the most selfish thing possible. So like, oh, okay, you had a really rough week, but then you get worship for all of eternity. Well, that's a good trade-off, right? That's pretty selfish of Jesus. So I think, you know, we have to distinguish between self-interest and self-sacrifice, or selfish, you know what I mean? So I think that's, that's right. Any other? Any other questions? All right, could, could you just go back to that first slide for me? All right, so if you didn't notice, this book's coming out in March 2016. You can pre-order it on Amazon already. That was my question. Oh, okay. When is All right. the book coming out? That's right. Thank you. Shameless Dr. plugs. Hill.